Hello again, we just started recording in the middle of, uh, of our session. Um, Gary, let, let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, tell me a little bit where you, where you uh, grew up, uh, how did you start playing uh, uh, music in general, sure. jazz? So I was born on April 4th, 1956 on Long Island, just outside oh, of New York City. So, uh, Mazal Tov. Thank you. Yes, Happy a couple of days ago. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so I started playing the alto saxophone when I was eight years old in uh, elementary school. Uh, what happened was the band director, whose name was Mr. Gary, I, I don't know how I still remember all of this. I was eight years old, 60 years ago. Uh, he, they, he was recruiting uh, clarinet players for the concert band in elementary school. And... Uh, and I thought, well, that sounds cool. I think I'll try that. And so that was it. So I just, I started playing the alto saxophone when I was eight. And it was just one of those things. It was just felt natural. And I enjoyed playing right away. And uh, so joined the band and started taking private lessons. I had some very good private teachers as a young person. Um, growing up, like I said, on Long Island, outside of New York. And uh, like a lot of other teenagers at that time, younger uh, musicians. I was also listening a lot to rock and roll. Jazz was way down the line. So I played electric bass in like a very bad uh, band that was trying to sound like Cream, you know, Eric Clapton and Jack Bruce. And uh, I played bass in that, not very good. And uh, all the way, you know, still continuing to play the alto saxophone. And when I was 13, I was um, just listening to the radio and came across a radio station and I heard uh, Fats Waller for the first time playing African Ripples, which was, mm -hmm. that was one of the first, that was the first kind of defining moment in terms of how I got into jazz, just accidentally uh, hearing Fats Waller. And it was a show run by a fantastic jazz disc jockey named Ed Beach, who had a show on WRVR uh, called Just Jazz, where he would, play five nights a week, a, 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 you know, a long show, 10 episodes, five episodes on uh, 10 hours of one artist. So that week happened to be Fats Waller. And then, so he would do Kenny Dorham, then he would do like, uh, you know, Kenny Drew, Tommy Flanagan, and just on and on and on and on. And it was just a, just a fantastic radio show and real true jazz education in terms of just, you know, an in-depth, listening analysis of all these great musicians so that was kind of it for me the first time i heard jazz was african ripples flats waller i was 13 and uh that was really like the beginning for me in terms of i was really drawn into this music and uh, so growing up on long island i was also it's really lucky that there were a lot of uh, aspiring musicians as well like uh, i grew up with kenny werner Glenn Drews, Billy Drews. I mean, Billy Drews is playing saxophone with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. I mean, so many young musicians. I mean, guys like Gary Dial, who was uh, played piano with Ira Sullivan and, and Red Rodney. These are all young musicians aspiring, you know, Jeff Hirschfield, the great drummer. Uh, these are all people that we grew up with. And there was a, a teacher on Long Island. His name was Joe Dixon. Not exactly a household name, but played with Bunny Berrigan and... Uh, Artie Shaw, and so he played alto saxophone and uh, flute and clarinet, and he had a big band on Long Island uh, called the Long Island Youth Neophonic Jazz Orchestra. So I kind of auditioned for that, got in that. He became a teacher. So at this point, I was playing alto saxophone. Baritone was way in the future. I had. Uh, so I was about 15, 16, and uh, really into jazz alto saxophone. Charlie Parker, Cannibal Alley, but Phil Woods was my real hero. Phil Woods was my my musical idol at that time. And uh, I mean, every, I did tried to be everything, play everything like Phil Woods. I even had a leather hat, leather strap. I mean, I was really copycat all the way. I tried to be Phil Woods. I wanted to be Phil Woods when I was 16, 17 years old. And so that was kind of it. There were also great musicians living on Long Island who became teachers like uh I mean, Arnie Lawrence, who you know, I'm sure. He was a teacher of mine. Uh, Billy Mitchell, great tenor player. Played with Dizzy Gillespie and Thad Jones in Detroit. He lived on Long Island. A lot of great drummers. Sonny Payne, Roy Haynes, 
uh, just on and on, just uh, all these great musicians living on Long Island. And there was a there was a club in Seaford near uh, near Jones Beach that uh, had jazz seven nights a week called Sonny's Place. And uh, so I started that be started to become a hangout place for me and uh, started getting the courage to sit in and play and starting to meet more people. And that was just kind of it, how it started. It was just a very natural, organic way of things progressing. A lot of it's being in the right place at the right time, having the right opportunities as a young musician, being given a chance and uh, having great teachers. So, and that just kind of went on until, uh, you know, 22 when I started to play the baritone, which is another, the second part of this story. So how come you started playing the baritone on the edge of the wind? <clears throat> All right. Well, the baritone came later. I, um, it was uh, the, I never wanted to play the baritone. The baritone was not something that I was even remotely interested in. Uh, I didn't really listen to a lot of baritone players, but uh, I had a group back on Long Island with, uh, like I said, this trumpet player, Glenn Drews, who um, got called to go join Woody Herman's band. This was in 1977. And so he left the group and went on tour with, with Woody Herman. At that point, Bruce Johnstone was playing baritone, um, who was one of the all-time greats on the baritone sax great. from New Zealand. Unbelievably great musician. So, you know, I'm, I'm still playing alto, doing my alto saxophone thing just uh, in school. And uh, the phone rings one day and it's Woody Herman's band calling me up, asking me if I wanted to go on the road and play baritone, take Bruce Johnstone's place. Because Glenn had recommended me and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't play the baritone. How did they why are they calling me? I don't I didn't even own a baritone. I never played the baritone. I never wanted to play the <clears> baritone. <throat> but at that point, Woody's band was touring 50 weeks a year. They're on the road all year playing. And uh, I was <clears throat> I was a senior in college and uh, three weeks away from graduating. So I had a choice. Well, do I go on the road or do I just stay home and finish my college education? But I figured, well, this job opportunity is not going to happen again if I don't take it. So I agreed. So I, I, I went out and bought a baritone and a mouthpiece and a bunch of reeds. And I had three weeks to memorize the baritone part of the Four Brothers and early autumn because the first two tunes every night the saxophone section went out front and played those two tunes from memory and so not only did i have never played the baritone before i had three weeks to kind of get some kind of a concept on the instrument and and memorize these two pieces so may 25th 1978 i got on the bus i went to bridgeport connecticut unpacked my baritone sat down in my seat look over to my right and I say, hi, I'm Gary Smolian. And I'm really nervous as can be because I, I, this is, I mean, I never played this before. And so I turn on, hi, I'm Gary Smolian. And, and the guy sitting next to me says, hi, I'm Joe Lovano. So Joe Lovano was in the band. Uh, Mark Johnson was playing bass at that point. And he was auditioning for Bill Evans, uh, which that he finally, he did get that gig. John Riley was playing drums, who's now playing dr drums with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, which was Thad Jones, Mel Lewis to start. Um, Dave LaLama, Ralph's brother, was playing piano and writing arrangements. Uh, it was really an incredible band. Great trumpet player, Dennis Dotson from Texas was playing. So that was really my first uh, experience, first of all, being on the road, and playing the and playing the baritone, and I was really incredibly nervous because one of Woody Herman's big pet peeves was alto saxophonists who played baritone, and so I was so nervous that he was going to fire me any second because I had no, I really had no concept on the instrument at all, no sound, no baritone concept. I could play the saxophone because I had I had good technique, but I really didn't have any idea in terms of the function of the baritone, what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to sound like. Um, it was really, I've, I've took, it was a fish out of water for a long time. Uh, and especially following Bruce Johnstone, who was a master on the instrument. So that was really <clears throat> nerve. Every night for six months, I said, that's I'm going to be sent home any second here. But I mean, I guess Woody heard something that he liked and he, uh, 
he I wound up staying for two years. And it was really during that two years that uh, I became a baritone saxophone and never played the alto again. That was it. It was really, it was just answering that phone call. That was really, that, that kind of started the whole thing. Um, it was nothing that I was looking for. It was nothing that I wanted. It was nothing that I dreamed about or fantasized about. It was just, it was just uh, fate answering the phone that day. That was really it. It was, it. and then because of that, I mean, it's a long and varied, a lot of opportunities to play with a lot of different great musicians on the baritone, which was just, I, I, I don't know, I even how to say it, just, just incredibly fortunate. Gary, um, th there are quite a few uh, alto sax saxophone who play the baritone because basically it's an octave lower, but, but, uh, but there is a difference between a, uh, playing the baritone and playing like an alto player who plays the baritone. I mean, you play differently when you play the baritone, right? Yeah, it's a different concept. I mean, also, because in terms of you resonate to the sound, the sound is a lower sonic pitch, you know, so it's really trying to, there's, there's also some kind of some technical things that, that, um, in terms of articulation on the baritone, you really have to articulate clearer because it's so low that if you don't really articulate the notes, it just sounds like, just like a, you know, a, a low stream of notes just kind of running together. So you have to have really clear articulation on the baritone. And it also takes more air, um, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, I think you have to find your concept on whatever instrument that you play. So... I mean, you have to kind of resonate to the sound first. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. If, you know, I, I don't, I, I, at this point, the baritone, the range and the note, I, that's really my identity. I relate to that sound, you know? So, and I think that's dr what draws people to play whatever instrument they play, whether it's a piccolo or a tuba or a bass or whatever it is, you have to kind of personally resonate to that, to the sound of that. So... So do you listen a lot to to other a uh, baritone player or players or or, or you mean just, now yeah. when you started playing the baritone now yeah. yeah when I started the, the I, I I had to go I had to go to school I mean I, I I really did not have any concept in terms of of the baritone at all so I I went I went first to Harry Carney Harry Carney became uh, <coughs> excuse me my go to in terms of you know, how does the baritone function in a big band how, in terms of sound, in terms of projection? Um, I mean, you know, F uh, Harry Carney was pr definitely the most important, historically important baritone saxophonist. And uh, so then from there, it was really kind of, you know, discovering all the great baritone players and, and just what their different concepts were. Leo Parker, Serge Shaloff, Lars Gulin, John Sermon. Uh, Pepper Adams, Nick Brignola, Ronnie Cuber. I mean, just the list goes on and on. And, uh, and uh, Charles Davis, uh, Bob Gordon. I mean, just so many you know, that I learned, I learned from everybody. And, uh, and I think that was really important to me just to try and figure out what is it about this instrument that, you know, what's going to make me a baritone player as opposed to an alto player who owns a baritone, plays a baritone. How am I going to be considered um a legitimate baritone player this is really my instrument and I, and I kind of own the sound and own the concept of this instrument you know and that took a long time and i it's not it doesn't end i'm still doing that you know it's i'm trying i'm learning new things all the time and even though harry carney beautiful sound amazing sound etc i mean <laughs> And, uh, and and Jerry Mulligan, etc. But you chose the lineage of Pepper Adams, basically. I did. Pepper Adams is my, uh, in terms of my major influence. Um, just, I mean, he's coming out of more of a modern Charlie Parker, more uh, harmonic, uh, tonal, uh, the way he plays time, the way he articulates, the edginess and the sound. A certain aggressiveness in the way he plays. Um, however, he's extremely lyrical as well. 
I love his tunes, which are very harmonically complex and uh, rhythmically complex. So, I mean, that was just my, I gravitated to that, that school, the uh, Pepper Adams, Nick Brignola school, Ronnie Cuba school of playing the baritone. That's just, that resonated with me because I, re, I, I for me, Charlie Parker and, uh, you know, Cannibal and that, that school of, out, of, of saxophone playing kind of, that's rings true to me. Right. So, and and of course, in 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 Israel, you're going to play a, a, a tribute set, a tribute concert to, to Pepper Adams. So, I suggest uh, let's listen to your uh, to 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 a song you recorded in a, in an album that you dedicated to Pepper Adams. So, mm -hmm. a, few, a few words about this album. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, well. That for me, that that this record remains one of my. Um, I mean, one of the things that I just my high points in my recording and playing career was. Uh, I, it, Tommy Flanagan played piano on it, and and at that point, Tommy Flanagan. I mean, well, Tommy Flanagan and Pepper grew up; they were childhood friends in Detroit. So, um, but at that point, Tommy was not recording as a side man; he was just recording with his own trio. He wasn't uh, interested in being a side man on any, anybody's records at that point. And, uh, but I, I presented this idea of recording Pepper's tunes and I, I, he actually graciously agreed to do it. And uh, I was, I mean, eight hours in the recording studio with Tommy Flanagan. That was like, I, I have no words to even describe what that was like. And so we played a bunch of Pepper's tunes. It was the record was called Homage. And it was with uh, Ray Drummond and Kenny Washington. And uh, I mean, just being around, I mean, I heard Tommy Flanagan dozens of times, but to be in the same room with him, creating music with him was, uh, that was special beyond words. It was just a short time after uh, uh, Pepper Yeah, Adams. Pepper died, exactly. Right, right. Okay, so let's listen <laughs> to uh, music and then we'll continue our conversation. Okay. Okay.
end. We're back. Ooh, Tommy Flanagan. Yeah. Wow. Easy. So um, after your two years on the road with uh, Woody Herman? Yeah. You return to well, to New York, basically. Well, you know what, what happened was, you know, in in uh, 1979, in the summer of 1979, Woody Herman's band and Thad Jones, Mel Lewis's band, we were on the same festivals. We were we were kind of following each other around uh, for the summer, and um, I got to meet Mel Lewis and Dick Oates and uh, and. Uh, Rufus Reed and Rich Perry and Ed Hickus and, you know, like folks playing in that band. So, you know, they got to hear me play and I got to hear them play. And we, and we met a whole number of times and uh, I was planning on leaving Woody's band anyway. And so basically Mel Lewis said to me, like, when, you know, when you come back to New York, give us a call and you can start to sub, you know, so Charles Davis was playing baritone at that point. And so I left, I stayed with Woody's band actually two years to the, to the day, May 25th. So I, I left, I came back 1980, May 25th of 1980 and called Dick Oates right away, let him know I was in town. And uh, I started subbing and then eventually um, Gary Prebeck, who was playing baritone, was really a tenor player. He wanted to play tenor. Uh, the tenor player, the tenor chair opened up, he moved over to tenor and Mel offered me that the job. So, you know, a few months after coming back, after leaving Woody's band and joining uh, and leaving, moving back to New York, I joined Mel Lewis's band uh, later on in, in um, 1980. So, you know, a lot of things that happened to me were really right place, right time, just luck. Uh, you know, I mean, being able to deal with the situation, but a lot of things happened just because I happened to be there at that moment. Um, I didn't, plan any of these things out and uh so just a, you know uh, just a long series of extremely fortunate moments uh, that have just happened through the years um so i wound up uh, subbing in the band but you know i've been listening to those records thad jones and mel lewis since i was a kid you know 15 16 years old so i knew those arrangements i knew how the music went i knew the charts i knew you know i was prepared i didn't come into the Excuse me, I didn't start subbing in that band, never having heard the music before. Uh, I was, I did my homework and I was ready, ready to kind of step in and, and uh, you know, and play. So um, it felt like a very organic fit from the right, you know, from, from right away. So, uh, and I'm still playing in that band today. I'm still, I'm still a part of that band. So 1980 till now. So it's uh, over 40 years. And um I mean, the music is fantastic. And this is Thad Jones centennial year. This is the hundredth birthday year of Thad Jones. Uh, March 28th, he would have been a hundred years old. So this is a really special year in, in jazz music, just recognizing that, you know, Thad Jones would have been a hundred this year. Um, and so the band is celebrating. We had, we're, we're out on the road. We're playing some concerts and, and doing some things in, in recognition of that. So, uh, that's really something. And, um, so yeah, so, and, and we've had like the sack, the thing that I really love about the band besides everything is, but I, the, uh, the saxophone section has been the same for almost for 35 years. We have had the same personnel, Dick Oates, Billy Drews, Ralph Lalama, Rich Perry, and myself. So we have, we've really, you know, kind of coalesced and developed into, uh, this really I mean, it's really an incredible saxophone section to be a part of. I mean, I just, I love playing with those guys. And, and we have like a certain sound and a certain vibe that we've really developed over the years. So it remains to be, it remains really just a special situation for everybody, um, especially playing in that saxophone section. So that was basically it. So came back and joined Mel Lewis's band right, right there. And then just being in New York and, you know, playing around other things happen. Just uh, a lot of it is just people hearing you, you know, it'd be, it, in in music it's just uh once again you know someone hears you play in a session they hire you someone hears you word of mouth they get hired you know it's just uh like i said it's been like this long series of just uh being fortunate and uh people hearing me at the right time and opportunities presenting themselves right so gary what was the music scene back then in new york in the 80s well compared to what's happening now in, in new york 
Oh, well, New York, you know, first of all, there were so many more clubs, uh, so a lot of so many more jam sessions. I mean, first of all, the, in the 80s, when I first joined Mel Lewis's band, the first set, we played three sets at the Village Vanguard. The first set was at 10 o'clock. So we would play 10 o'clock, midnight, and two. You know, so we would play, we would get out of there, you know, and then we would hang out. And, you know, there were many times where, you know, Ralph Loama and Dennis Irwin and I, we would like leave there at seven in the morning. You know, we would like the sun would be out and, and, you know, people would be going to work and we've been just hanging on all day. It was, there, there was a lot more hanging out back then. I mean, New York is now relatively an early city. You know, now the first set at the Vanguard is at 10 o'clock. The second set, I mean, the first set's at eight o'clock. And the second says at 10 o'clock, I'm home by, you know, 12, 12 o'clock usually where 12 o'clock, we weren't even playing the second set yet. And then there was Bradley's, which was a piano bar, which went really late. And then there were jam sessions like at the Savoy that would start at one in the morning and go till six and all these uh, places to play. New York was a really jam session, late night town with a lot of musicians, a lot of places to play. Um, I guess like uh, everything else in life, things change and develop and, you know, they turn into something else. But uh, it, New York, I mean, for a young musician really aspiring to want to play, you could play all night. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were, and just you could just go from club to club to club to club and uh, and just, you know, stay out and hang out and play all night. Um, unfortunately, it's not like that anymore. I mean, there are a few jam sessions. I think Smalls has a jam session. That goes till about five or four. Smoke has a jam session, not quite so late, but uh, it wasn't the vibrancy that you know. The, and 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 I think that was even, you know, I, I and I keep hearing like, well, from the sixties, I wasn't there, but sixties and fifth, I mean, it was a whole other thing than that, you know. So um, I caught I caught the tail end of of New York as a real late night jam session city in terms of a lot of musicians hanging out uh that's uh, and i've and, and for young musicians starting out today i my heart goes out to them because they don't have that it's really hard to find opportunities to play and hang out and to be heard and to hear other people it's not it's just it's not the same as it was so i mean the, the whole whole scene of music is completely different than it was you know when i came up right um well you played the bar sex of course and when we talked before before the uh, this meeting we talked about the fact that uh, there aren't a lot of uh, Barry sex who are like stars actually there's there's one Jerry Mulligan mm -hmm. but the biggest name like pepper Adams uh, 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 Nick Brignola uh, uh, Ronnie Cuber etc when we're we're not stars not mm -hmm. the way that tenor sex or or alto sex were mm -hmm. um why is that you think <laughs> oh man why well, uh, well you know I, i i i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the, the range of the baritone it's like it's uh it's low it's not necessarily a sexy It's not uh, accessible. Um, I mean, you know, the way, I mean, J Jerry Mulligan was, was the only real big star on the, bear, on the instrument ever. And, but, you know, his sound was kind of light and he was very melodic. I mean, there was a certain aspect the way he, of the way he approached the instrument. It was very lyrical. It was very melodic. Um, you know, I think it was, I think, people responded to that to the way he played where pepper was very aggressive and very you know uh his sound was a lot more biting a lot more uh edgy uh rougher um in terms of tone and approach um so you know it's, it's an interesting thing but in question in terms of why has there only been in the history of the music only one baritone saxophone player who really kind of broke out in in terms of commercial and critical success in terms of being able to lead a band have be a band leader not just kind of traveling and picking up rhythm sections in which you know everybody else besides jerry that's that's was kind of the story of their career um but i think 
And my, and also, I mean, Mulligan was just an, a genius in terms of his orchestrating, the way he orchestrated music, his concept of counterpoint. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I mean, he was above and, you know, the pack in terms of his con musical conception. He was a total genius in terms of music. And what he presented was so particular and so um, personal, you know, such a personal approach that was accessible people really responded to it. And uh, so I think that's kind of it. You know, it's just, um, it's just also the music business in terms of, uh, you know, maybe there's just not enough room for to have like a whole bunch of baritone players. I mean, even now you don't see at festivals and, you know, you've, it's very unusual to see a baritone saxophone led band <laughs> at a major jazz festival at clubs. I mean, it's, I don't really see that, you know, I, or even like, as a part of a, a group with a, a quintet or less than five horns, it's very unusual to see a baritone player in the front line uh, of groups appearing at, at, at venues in, in the, you know, anywhere in the world. It's, uh, you know, so, but given that it's my instrument, it's my voice. Uh, I love playing it. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful for all the opportunities that I do have. True. So is that, I mean, Uh, we got a question from from Alon, one of those uh, uh, who listen to us right now and he asked you um as a, as a musician with the with the such a huge uh, solo career what makes you continue uh playing with the big bands all these years oh well I mean I, I, I don't play with a lot of big bands anymore it's uh um you You know, I still play with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. That's kind of the only big band I play with at this point. But, you know, the, the big bands that I did play with, like Dave Holland, I mean, I, the, the thing that draws me is the music. It's like, uh, you know, and, and also the opportunity to be, to contribute my, uh, you know, to the music. A lot of times playing the baritone in the big band can be less than satisfactory in a lot of times because you don't get a lot of solos. You don't you know your part's not necessarily the most interesting in terms of you know you're not playing a lot of interesting notes in the voicings um but you know the thing that's that draws me to uh, uh the big bands that I have played with are you know the arrangements the the way that the baritone is used in the orchestration uh Dave Holland writes beautifully for the baritone Thad Jones writes beautifully for the baritone Bob Brookmeyer writes beautifully for the baritone so a lot of times even though if there's not a lot of soloing the parts are very fun to play because I, I have some of the you know best notes in the voicings in the chords um but you know at this point you know first of all there aren't a lot of big bands also I don't double I don't play bass clarinet flute or clarinet I only play the baritone so that eliminates me you From a lot of big bands at this point because most younger arrangers they write for a lot of doubles and I don't I don't really want to do that I just want to play the baritone and that's been both a blessing and a curse as the years have gone by because I've lost gigs because I don't double but because I just concentrate on the baritone and I've really wanted to forge a voice on this instrument you know that an identity on the on, and a sound on the instrument that other opportunities have presented itself because of that um, so you know it's like everything you have choices to make I mean uh, I was never going to be a great doubler anyway because there are so many people who do such a better job than me that I would never be able to compete on that level so I just kind of gave up doing that and focused on being a jazz baritone saxophone player um, so at this point really the only big band I play with is is the band at the village Vanguard um, But I did I did come up playing with a lot of big bands just because first of all there were a lot of them there a lot of them existed at the time and it's a really good education in terms of learning how to play in a section how to play in tune how to phrase uh, the role of the baritone is interesting because sometimes you're playing with a bass sometimes you're playing with the bass trombone you're playing with the low voice of the piano uh, sometimes you're playing with the trombones I mean it's there's a, the baritone is really interesting in a big band in terms of there's a lot of You're, you're playing with a lot of different folk different people in the band and you have to kind of figure out the tuning and the time and the articulation and the phrasing 
I mean, that's the thing. What I loved about playing with Dave Holland, Dave Holland wrote great for the for, for the baritone because uh, he studied Billy Strayhorn and Duke Ellington, who wrote great. <laughs> Um, and so I got to play a lot of just vamps with Dave, just, you know, he and I just playing together over these, you know, these kind of rolling vamps. And I was like, wow, playing time with Dave, top of Dave Holland was just like, oh, that was just one of the greatest things ever. And I wasn't, you know, wasn't soloing. It was just creating a groove and a moment and a vibe. And it was just like, man, it just felt so incredible. So I guess, you know, the big man thing, I think there's a lot of value. I wish there were more opportunities for young musicians to have an opportunity to play in big bands because um, you just learn a lot from that experience, just in terms of how to, how to be a better musician that you're not, if you don't ever play in a big band, you're not going to, you're not going to have a chance to hone those skills, which carry over into a lot of other situations. Right. So, um, Another another uh, uh, subject. Um, among when when I see your your discography, I count I think four albums with the uh, uh, contrafacts. At least four albums. Um, so first of all, please please help me uh, explain or remind the. Uh, our listeners, what are contrafacts? Okay, well, contrafacts are uh, original melodies that are composed over a pre-existing set of chords, usually something from the American popular songbook, Cole Porter, uh, Jimmy Van Usen, George Gershwin. I mean, probably the best known is like, would say like Olio, uh, you know, which is I Got Rhythm. There's hundreds of contrafacts written on George Gershwin's chord progression of I Got Rhythm. And the reason is you can't copyright a set of chords. You can only copyright a melody. So if you record I Got Rhythm, the melody of I Got Rhythm, you have to pay royalties to the George Gershwin estate. But if you write an original melody over the chords, that becomes your song. So jazz musicians did this so they could keep the royalties of the tunes that they wrote because you can't uh, copyright a set of chord progressions. So this became a standard practice of jazz musicians to pick tunes that they like and write their own melodies over the top. That way they, that, that tune becomes theirs. So that's a called a contrafact. <clears throat> and there is a, excuse me, there was a um, fantastic, uh, he's a, it's also a psychiatrist, but he was a pianist and a flutist that he's not a household name at all, but he's very important. He grew up with Nick Brignola. His name is Reese Markowitz. And he wrote a unbelievably great book on substitute harmony, probably from my, in my opinion, the best book on tritone subs and substitute harmony called Inside Outside. And uh, he also was a, um, expert on these on contrafacts so he became a friend he was he was living on long island as well and i hung out with him a lot and he really you know helped me with a lot of these tunes kind of discovering a lot of these contrafacts and it's really interesting because you know there's a, there's thousands of these tunes and a lot of them have rec just been recorded once and never recorded again and uh and it's just you can just get you know go down this rabbit hole and just never come out. I mean, it's 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 actually kind of fascinating. So so let's hear uh, let's hear um, um, Quicksilver from your second, I think, uh, uh, contra contract album. Uh, More treasures, yeah. More so treasures. Quicksilver is uh, Horace Silver, Horace Silver's tune on "Lover Come Back to Me." And it was originally recorded by uh, at, at Birdland with Clifford Brown, Lou Donaldson, and Art Blakey. Uh, and and uh, volume, there's two volumes live at Birdland. So this goes way back. This is a great tune. So it's Lover Come Back to Me. Okay, let's listen to it. Thank you. 
Okay, Qu Quicksilver. Silver. Really like this tune. Um, ah, it's a good song. Um, 
I mean, you, you were saying that the, when I asked you about uh, why uh, Barry Sachs is not that popular, um, uh, you said that because of the sound and the graph sound, etc. But 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 I mean, Baritone can play amazingly beautiful ballads. That's true. And Harry Carney was an amazing ballad player. Mm-hmm. Or sure what and um and even pepper Adams and etc I mean they all played the beautiful ballads um I don't know if, do you do you know uh, Harry Carney's uh, a string album yeah sure it's, it's beautiful an amazing, an amazing beautiful album and I remember that uh, when just to tell you that uh, I really like uh, really love your your strings album you have Thank a, you. Um, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe we'll, we'll listen to, to uh, one of his, the melodies over there. Well, you know, that was uh, actually, uh, we got really lucky uh, with that record. That was, uh, that was a really stressful day because uh, that was the first time that Criss Cross Records was going to, was going to multi-track. Um, usually they recorded live to two-track and... Uh, so this is the first time that they were gonna that they were gonna multi-track. So we had, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time to record anyway for for these you know, for Crisscross or for any other small label basically. So we had six hours to make that record, and uh, but it turned out the recording engineer forgot, or there was a problem with the with the machine, and uh, so it took him two hours to get it fixed. So that record, uh, we did that record in four hours and no rehearsal and uh, everything's a first take and we didn't listen back to anything. It was just, oh. uh, it was really not an easy day. And, uh, but I mean, we had a great string section and, you know, it was Regina Carter and, and uh, you know, I mean, just really a stellar string section from New York at that point. And, uh, and it was really Bob Belden I mean, if you don't, Bob Belden was really an important musician, uh, composer, arranger, tenor saxophonist, soprano saxophonist, archivist, uh, uh, scholar, just one of the most brilliant musicians I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and, uh, and being a friend. And uh, so he made this record happen uh, by being so super organized. So we basically did this record in four hours. And then we also did, you know, we did our take and then the strings went back and did a second pass. So to double sound of the, to, to double the sound of the strings. Um, so like I said, we recorded that record. First take, no list. We didn't listen back to any of it. So we, we had no idea what we were going to get. And uh, it was just, like I said, Bob Belden's brilliance and everybody's playing in the, in the band and, uh, and the string that really made that record really gel so i i'm really kind of proud that's one of my favorite recordings just because of uh it was a real new york moment the fact that you know we didn't have a lot of luxury to to spend a lot of time on any of it and uh i mean a lot of people comment they say they really like that record and, and i just i like to tell the story because it was uh I, I was almost like it was not meant to be but it but it was meant to be great i never <laughs> It's an amazing story. So so let's hear uh, uh, Lush Life, uh, one of my favorite ballads ever. Yeah, this so. is beautiful too because there's no it's, there's no improvising. It's just it's just the melody, and listen how beautiful yeah. Bob Elman's arrangements are. Oh my God, it's, he was such a genius, this guy. And you can hear the the way baritone sax uh, sax players are playing. You know, ballads. So, lush life. Okay, well, thank you.
Okay. That's slash left. But that's beautiful. Okay. Oh man, thank you. Uh, we almost reached uh, the end. Wait. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, we almost reached the end of our uh, short meeting, but uh, I will not let you go before telling me how the three baritone band uh, came to be. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the second concert we'll have on, uh, on May 3rd. Mm -hmm. with two great uh, baritone sax, sax players here in Israel. Robert and Chipolovsky was here. Ooh, I saw him, yeah. He's here and he's great. And also sure, yeah. Elad Gellert, uh, which will you meet when you arrive in Israel. Also, looking forward about the, uh, the three baritone band. Yeah, so it, um, it was, an, I believe it was in it was early 80s that uh, there was this great festival in Rome called the. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it was the uh, Jazz and Montalcini. Well, I forget that Jazz and Film, or it was a great festival in, in at this beautiful villa in Rome. And uh, so we had this idea that after Jerry, after Jerry passed, uh, the festival promoter uh, John Perro Roubaix, and I think Roberta, which was Roberta Arnold, was Ronnie Huber's uh, manager and kind of ex partner in life, and. Uh, so they had this idea of putting on this this uh, concert in, mem in memory of, of Jerry Mulligan as part of this festival. And that was kind of the beginning of this band. Uh, it was Ronnie Cuber, Nick Brignola, and myself. And we had an Italian rhythm section. And uh, so Ronnie contributed a bunch of music. Bob Belden contributed some music. And that was that was kind of the the genesis of the of, of this band kind of um, of uh kind of getting launched and uh, we had we had a ball it was it was fantastic to to play mulligan's music and you know the interesting thing was that you know ronnie nick and myself you know we really didn't play like that we our concept was more like you know Charlie coming at a bird and you know so we kind of used jerry's beautiful tunes and the arrangements as a springboard to how we played so it was it was kind of a really interesting combination in terms of how we played in jerry's music um, and then uh, Roberta organized a, a recording session for Dreyfus, which is a French label. So we were able to record and we only made one record, just a three baritone saxophone band plays Mulligan. But, uh, you know, we actually did stay together for eight years. Uh, we toured. We played a lot in Europe. Uh, we had some really great uh, rhythm section players, Jimmy Cobb, Dennis Irwin. Um, so many great musicians came through, you know, that band. And then uh, once uh, Nick Rignola passed, um, that was tough. And uh, Charles Davis did a few gigs. Howard Johnson came in and played. Um, but I guess, like, you know, a lot of things just uh, it kind of had its time. And, and uh, you know, we just kind of went our separate ways. But uh, uh, it was really eight incredible great years and i for me to be able to to be on the stage with ronnie and nick you know kind of getting my butt kicked every night by those two guys was uh was a great experience for me i learned a lot just uh from being on the stage with them that was a, a really high point of being able to play with two of my idols and they the two of them were two of my biggest heroes on the baritone and to be able to just stand on the stage with them and play music with them was uh both an amazing education and an honor and a privilege that I'll never forget. And looking forward to playing this music again in Israel. Yeah, with the with the original uh, charts. We, yes, I think we can say it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm just gonna we're gonna listen to uh, "Walking Shoes," like a very okay. famous Jerry uh, tune, and just gonna. Just going to say that personally, Nick Brignola is a, is a favorite hero of mine. Uh, I try to collect every single album that he recorded as a leader and as a sideman. It, it was amazing. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, let's listen to uh, Walking Shoes. Sure.
That was amazing. So Ronnie Huber played first, Mick McNola played second, and then I played last. And uh, Andy McKee, right? On, on yeah. Bass. I think Steve Johns was on drums, yeah. So that was, yeah, that was a lot of fun during those years. So basically, we're going to recreate this uh, uh, on uh, on uh, May 3rd. Yeah. Come over, so, guys. Look forward. It's going to be nice. It's going to be great. Uh, Gary, that's it for now. I mean, I'm, um, I'm done asking questions. And uh, if uh, if anyone uh, wants to ask any any question or, or remark, just use the raise your hand app, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'll unmute you and let you speak your mind. I just want to say I'm really looking forward to these this time coming up, coming back to Israel. It's 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 a thrill, and I'm I'm ah, just I have no words. Really looking forward to coming back and be able to play with all these great musicians who uh, you know, just, yeah, looking forward to the whole thing. It's going to be a lot of fun, for sure. And uh, to meet again. Yes. Okay. If there's, there aren't any more questions, guys, you can ask me after that, and I'll uh, pass it along with, to Gary if you have uh, any more questions. Please. And, yeah, uh, happy to Thing. I'm going to say thank you so much, Gary, for spending uh, some time with us. Thank you. Wait, wait, I have a question here for Moshe. Moshe, go ahead. Can I mute yourself? <clears throat> okay. Never mind. Guys, going to see you. Uh, thank you for, so much for coming. Tada Shabbat. Um, uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat and, Shalom. Uh, and we're going to meet each other on uh, right. early May. Yes. Won't be long. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Thank you. Nice to talk to you.